I'm Dustin Harder, and this is Keep On Cooking. Hello and welcome to Keep On Cooking, the only podcast dedicated to plant-based cookbooks. I'm your host, Dustin Harder, and here's your one chance, fancy, don't oh. let me down. It's my husband and producer of the fine podcast, Mr. Rossetti. How's it going? I'm good. I'm feeling fancy. He's feeling fancy. I'm feeling fancy like our friend Reva. Reva. Friend of the podcast. Friend of the podcast. I'm just hoping. I mean, let's just hope. I'm, I'm, I'm just sure she's. Say it. I'm I know it on my vision board. She has not written a cookbook, but she has written. There's like a. I can't remember what it's called. It's probably out of print now, but it's like called Comfort from a Country Quilt. I can't oh, remember what's in it, though. We'll need to look that it feels up. That very her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. Like there should be one called like Reba's Roasts or something like or Reba. Reba. Why do you keep saying Reba? I can't. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, so just a reminder, everyone, we're available on video now on YouTube. But as this is uh, the interview we're about to share with you was recorded before we started doing video. So for now, you've got David and I on the intro and then you've got audio for the interview. But eventually it's going to be all video all the time. Can't stop, won't stop. We have a favorite authors. Will be on yes, video. yes, yes. And we've got uh, an amazing author today. Today, his name is Dr. Sheil Shukla. And uh, this book, Plant Based India, is so good. But let's talk a little bit about Indian food, David. What's some stuff that we love to order out? Like so many things um alu matar mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. really samosas yeah i mean love the samosas. you can't yeah. not have samosas a little chickpea masala in there yeah. all the little sauces that I come with everything sauces. i love a little sauce we love so a little sauce Indian, it's so it's good like you get those little things i don't even know what any of them are but they're all delicious yes and we love this book so much it's got so, so many good. great things in it and it's, it's big and gorgeous and full of wonderful pictures that dr shiel shukla gorgeous. has done all on his own it's just beautiful if you're watching the pod i'm holding it up right now this cover is outstanding we talk about the cover in the interview he goes through what all of these dishes are yeah. on the front here because there is an array of delicious things available a couple things we made in this book we made the pollock pal tofu and the matar tofu and the the matar tofu has this delicious tomato and oh, onion masala base delicious then did we did we make naan oh yeah we made the naan and naan for me is a non-starter oh it's well wait I, that doesn't that mean it's a it's, it's a non-starter you have to have it with every meal oh yeah yeah yeah, and yeah it has yeah, to yeah. have garlic on it it's for me so but good. like it's just and the delicious. recipe was so easy so easy yeah yes. i remember didn't we try another We've tried. There I think was we've another tried a non bread that was just a little. Yes. It was and a lot. lot. We, it was delicious, but like this was. Really uh, easy. This one was more delicious. I'll say that. We yeah. won't say who it was by the other one that we did, but this one by Dr. Shiel Shukla does it, and he is an internal medicine physician and food artist who is passionate about the intersection of food, art, and medicine. Yeah, he loves exploring cultures through their food, and his primary experience is with South Asian foods. Um, his culinary creations have garnered the support of over 70,000 followers on Instagram. Yes, yes, yes. And I believe he is the plant based artist on Instagram. I looked that up. I want to look that up for you right now and make sure I point you in the right direction because I realized we just told you how many followers he has. But. We Where are we this. sending you? I'm sure he says you? it in the interview too. Yes, it's the plant-based artist. He's got 70,000 followers that. on there. He's also a contributor for Best of Vegan, a digital culinary publication dedicated to veganism and plant-based cuisine. And he has been featured by Forks Over Nice, Veg News, Thrive Magazine, Food 52, William Sonoma, and more. I love chatting with him and getting the dish on writing this mm -hmm. truly fabulous book. Here he is to chat about plant-based India. Dr. Sheil Shukla. Food is medicine, but that doesn't mean boring or lacking in flavor. Here he is giving us whole foods served up authentically with bold flavors in his new book, Plant-Based India. It's Dr. Sheil Shukla. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Dustin. Yes, I'm thrilled that you're here. I love this book. We're going to jump in with your icebreaker question. What's something you've drawn inspiration from recently? Recently, I would say the season. So summer, you know, all of the produce is perfectly in season. Um, it's just such an inspiring time. Summer is one of my favorite seasons, um, you know, when it comes to tomatoes, you know, corn, you know, really anything you get is really it's absolutely delicious. And it's just fun to, you know, just go to the farmer's market, go to the grocery store, see what's in season, pick it up and uh, just be inspired by whatever's um, perfectly in season. So, yeah, I love that. You're in Chicago. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. 
Do you have a favorite farmer's market that you go to there? I actually just moved out uh, to, this, to the north suburbs. Um, so I'm, okay. I'm still searching for an ideal farmer's market up here. Yes. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, farmer's markets that I've been to in the city is the Lincoln Park uh, farmer's markets. And that's definitely one of my favorites. Nice. Have you made anything recently seasonally that comes to mind? I actually just made a tomato soup today. So um, tomato, it, the weather here is just starting to become a little bit cooler. So uh, tomato soup is one of my favorite things to make kind of in the late summer, early fall, uh, when the weather's a little bit cooler and tomatoes are still in season. Yeah, we're getting there. We're starting to shift. So we start to get to have all the yummy uh, autumnal foods coming our way. So it's a good time. That's right. Well, for me, inspiration lately, I just did, so I work with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I'm the culinary specialist there. And I'm, I'm in my first year there. And every year we have the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. And I just went to that last weekend. So I've been feeling very energized and sort of fueled by that, being around that energy. You know how it is when you're around like-minded people who sort of view food and the environment and everything the same way. It's a very uh, inspiring situation. That's awesome. And I actually went to that same conference a few years back, and I totally get that. That was an extremely inspiring conference to go to. You have to come back and see us next year, then. It was so great to have it in person. Absolutely. I would love to come. I really wanted to come this year, but you know, things were kind of crazy this year. So I understand. I, and plus, we're all still in that phase where we're like, are we getting back out? Are we doing the thing? What's going on? You know, Some of us are dipping our toe, and some of us are going all the way. You know, We're all going at our own pace here a little bit. That's right. That's right. Well, you grew up being well-versed in Indian cooking because I read you, you also have, well, you, you were raised in the suburbs outside of Milwaukee and your grandmother lived with you and you were surrounded by Indian culture, cuisine, and food. So it seems food has always been a strong part of your foundation, but when and how did veganism sort of align with the food for you? Yeah, so growing up, uh, eating at home was a huge, uh, you know, hugely important thing in our lives. Um, having home-cooked meals made by my mother, my, by my grandmother as well. Uh, when it comes to veganism, though, um, you know, I guess part of it was rooted in the fact that my family was vegetarian while I was growing up. So we ate primarily vegetarian foods um, at home. And then ultimately in college, uh, I watched documentaries um, such as Forks Over Knives. That was kind of in my junior, senior year of college. Um, and that's what really opened my eyes to what veganism was, um, what you know the overall values are. Um, and that's when I really started to think about what I was eating uh, and the impact that it had on not only myself, but uh, the people of the world around me. Um, and that's when I really started delving more into uh, veganism. So I would say senior year of college is where that all really started. Yeah, it's amazing. The documentaries, I'm so glad that we just keep getting more and more to share with people too. And it's amazing how different documentaries have sort of different uh, impacts for different people, you know, uh, and, and they come at you at a certain time in life. If you could recommend one to somebody right now, what would you tell them to go watch? Oh, good question. So I, I really still like Forks Over Knives. Um, you know, Game Changes is, is another really cool one too. I think there's that's um, there's a different audience for that in terms of athletes, of course. But um, you know, honestly, I really like every documentary that I've watched uh, about veganism. So um, really, anything you choose will be um, pretty eye opening. I think. Yeah, and it's kind of cool, the Game Changers one, how it is, you know, geared towards athletes, but I think it it shifts a lot of people's sort of perception on, you know, performance in vegan food, and it has them going, well, if an, if an athlete can eat it, then I can eat it too. So it's it's sort of a win-win with that one. Absolutely. Well, and of, of course, you have a, you know, you're well versed in Indian cooking, but you have a fondness here, I'm reading for Mediterranean flavors, American classics, among many others. Do you remember what your first vegan cookbook was, like the first vegan cookbook you owned? Oh, that's a really tough question. I actually didn't really get into cookbooks much initially. I started off uh, really watching YouTube videos. Um, and that's kind of where I really started uh, cooking um, is through watching YouTube videos. When it comes to cookbooks, I, I'm trying to think back. I want to say one of the first ones I got was um, uh, Nisha Vora's uh, Vegan Instant Pot Cookbook. Um, I think that's probably one of the earliest ones I got. Um, I think I was in college around that time. Um, but I, I think that's probably one of the first. And really, my collection has really grown from that. Now I have sure. <laughs> 30 cookbooks now. So. Amazing. Do you have a favorite? 
one that you go to. I, I mean, we don't want to single anyone out, but we do. Is there one that you sort of go to again and again that has become a standby for you? I think a standby, I guess, which is technically not a cookbook, more just a cooking resource, um, is the Vegetarian Flavor Bible. Um, that is one of my favorite books because there are technically no recipes in it. It's just about flavor, um, you know, combinations. So that's something that I like because oftentimes I go to the store, pick something up, and then I try to think of what goes well with it. And that's a great resource to have. That's great. That is a great resource. And speaking of books, let's get into your amazing book. I love it so much. Plant-Based India, Nourishing Recipes, Rooted in Tradition, gorgeous hardcover book full of vibrant photos. And of course, we need to share with all of the listeners here that you did the photography for this book as well. It's stunning. How was it for you writing the recipes and also providing the photography for these? Thank you for your kind words. Well, for me, it was extremely important that I do the photography also. I started cooking really as an art form, I, and photography has always been an integral part of uh, the cooking process for me. So um, not only was it important to develop all the recipes my, by myself, but also to do the photos uh, because I do have an art background as well. So um, for me, an additional touch also was you know, giving that cultural um, touch in the photography as well. So the personal touch when it comes to, you know, all the decisions I made in terms of what um, plates I use, the bowls that I use, uh, the fabrics that you see photographed in the picture, um, everything was very intentional. And, um, you know, for me, it was really important to have that personal touch. That's great. And it shows, the details definitely show through in all of these photos. They really are beautiful. And this cover, I love this color. You feature several dishes on the cover. Do you have the book on you right now? Can you look at the cover and just walk us through what are each of those items that you have presented on the cover? Yeah, so the cover is uh, tali. So tali is a plate. Um, it's a way of serving a meal. Um, with you know, throughout India, every state has kind of their own version of a tali. But uh, mine uh, specifically is a Gujarati tali. So uh, a tali that comes from the state of Gujarat, where uh, my family family is from as well. Uh, and there are a few major components. So right in the center, you see a uh, brown rice. Um, rice being, of course, a staple in the Indian diet. And then uh, right to the right of that, you see a flatbread that's called rotli, that's made out of whole wheat uh, flour. And then going kind of clockwise from there, um, there's a mango rust. So rust is essentially just pureed mango, but it's super ripe uh, mango that's you know, a sweet um, accompaniment to the, the overall meal. Um, Continuing clockwise is a few vegetable dishes. So we have one made of cauliflower and peas, uh, one of cabbage, another of potatoes, um, and then uh, bell peppers. And then um, right next to the, the flatbread on the other side is uh, a dal. So dal being uh, lentils. Um, so this is a stewed lentil dish, um, specifically Gujarati dal, which is known for its sweet, spicy, um, you know, tangy uh, and sweet uh, flavor profile. All look so delicious. And everybody, did you hear those whole healthful foods that were mentioned there? It's just so vibrant and full of color, but also looks so tasty. That I, I want to dive into that little ramekin of mango there. It looks so yummy. Mm -hmm. uh, and from the jump here in your book, you get into explaining why India and why plant-based. So what the connection is for you, right? So tell us, why India, Dr. Shukla? Yeah, well, India... It what I say about India is that it comprises my culinary heritage. And what I mean by that is um, this is the food I grew up with, you know, the, the food of my family, the, the foods that we've been eating for generations on end. And, and, you know, of course, you know, I would say about half of the book is directly linked to my family and the other half is things that I developed over time. Um, but why India is, is, you know, India is, is what I grew up with. It's the culture that I, that's been so deeply ingrained into me. Um, so that's really the core of, of what this book is about. Well, and you elaborate on important nutrients and sources for a plant-based diet with protein, omega-3, fatty acids, iron, iodine, calcium, vitamin D, and B12. You dive into all that stuff, which is so fantastic. And of course, we get some general recipe notes and look into some must-haves for the Indian pantry and the likes of spices, seeds, roots, bark, flowers, and fruits. What would you say your most used spices? I, I think one of the most used spices is a combination of spices. So um, that is garam masala, 
<clears throat> garam masala, of course, being a combination of uh, warm spices, including cinnamon, cardamom, clove, nutmeg. Um, my version includes mace as well. Um, so a few different, uh, various different spices, and it's just one single blend. Uh, and that blend on its own packs a ton of uh, depth of flavor and nuance um, that's really critically important to many Indi North Indian dishes. Well, I would imagine you're sort of like a mixologist when it comes to spices with, with all of your knowledge with all of this, because I know I make my own garam masala or sometimes I buy it depending on the recipe or the book I'm cooking from, of course. So there's garam masala. Are there any other spice blends that you always sort of have on hand? Garam masala would be the key spice blend. Um, otherwise, like you said, it's kind of mixing up spices um, just on my own. Another key spice uh, blend that I always have on hand, actually two, uh, and I have recipes for both of these as well, is one would be jat masala. That's a, um, a saltier, uh, tangier version uh, of a spice blend that can be used to, to garnish dishes. And then another um, a spice blend is uh, sambar masala or sambar uh, bodhi. So that's um, a South Indian uh, spice blend. And the main difference there is that it includes um, uh, lentils in it. Uh, so it has a chana dal and urad dal. Um, so that would be like the Indian chickpea and a white lentil, technically a black lentil that has had the husk removed. And that really gives a ton of uh, a nuttiness um, and a different flavor profile altogether, um, which is really characteristic of, of South Indian cuisine. And this is great here. Uh, listeners, he has a diagram in here with the dal and the, the beans, and it sort of breaks everything down, and it's got a great photo here, and it, it, it identifies them all for you. So, so he, he leads the way for you here. It's really great. And in the general notes, you also discuss recipes, titles, language, and pronunciation. Can you expand on that? Yes, yeah, so for me, it was very important to stick to the original names when it was applicable. So um, to stick to the, the Gujarati names for these dishes or the Hindi names or sometimes the, um, uh, you know, other whatever Indian language uh, the dish comes from um, and to have that original language there. So that was very important for me to maintain that authenticity. Uh, and of course, the head note is there to explain what that uh, you know, what the title means a little bit further. But when it comes to using the authentic terms, um, I really did not shy away from, from using those terms. And in these head notes, as you're saying, I mean, everybody, you get a nice dose of education in here. So it is, this book is practical, functional, and you're also expanding your knowledge at the same time. It's fantastic. Also in the notes, you bring up aliums, which are onions and garlic. I love that you give options in this book to sub this out uh, for someone who needs them for you know personal uh, or religious practices. I had a client a client once that practiced Jainism, and I had to get pretty creative. It was my first time managing it, and I figured it out. But this book certainly would have been <laughs> helpful to have at the time. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there are many reasons why people might might want to um, avoid those ingredients. So it's important for me to include that information. It's great. And our first chapter here is starters and lighter meals with offerings like roasted aloo chop, tofu tikka, and crispy masala dosa rolls. I actually made the chili cauliflower tofu tonight for dinner, and it was tangy, salty, and spicy. All of the things I wanted. Is there something from this chapter you love to serve to guests when they come over? Um, I would say in terms of serving to guests, I, I would say maybe to that are good for guests. So one is a tofu tikka. Um, that's kind of your classic uh, Indian restaurant fare. Um, it's a crowd pleaser for sure. Um, it does require a little bit of advanced prep, but when it comes to preparing it for people coming over, it's something easy to prepare in advance. Um, and then something that I actually haven't made yet for a group, um, but I made a few times, of course, when writing the book was the dabeli crostini. So crostini being, of course, any good uh, party appetizer, but um, this takes um, on the flavors of Gujarat in the form of a, a, a dabeli, which is a, a potato-based sandwich uh, with some a ton of flavor. So the flavor comes from uh, the sweet and sour chutney. Um, there's some save in there, which is a crispy um, chickpea flour noodle. Uh, there's some pomegranate seeds. Uh, just, it, but it seems kind of random with the amount of ingredients that are in there, but it all works together in harmony, and it's a lot of fun to to prepare for guests. 
<laughs> I was going to say, I love that you were, you started by saying the flavor comes from here, but then you had a, a few more elements to it. And I was like, this all sounds amazing, actually. Put it together and bring it to the table. It sounds so good. <laughs> uh, our, our next chapter is snacks. What are a couple snacks you always have on hand from this chapter? Yeah, I think uh, an easy snack that's, you know, you know what I always like to have is uh, hanvo. So hanvo is uh, a baked... Um, uh, lentil and rice, um, almost like a like a savory cake of sorts, uh, and then there's some zucchini and other vegetables in there too. Um, you know, we tend to always have that on hand, and something that my um, my parents and my in laws like a lot. Uh, you know, to have with chai or just as a snack in the afternoon. I mean, you had me at cake, sweet or savory. I'm into it. So it's the handvo you said. Yep, that's right delicious and chapter three brings us into soups and salads i love me a sweet corn soup that's in here so i'll have to make that and the creamy masala tomato soup speaking of tomato soups it sounds so good with the cashew cream and finishing off with the mint for that little extra pop of flavor but what's a favorite salad of yours from here I, easily the garam masala poppered salad so every single time that i've made it it's just been such a hit um it's it's a great introductory dish if um, someone's just getting involved with indian cooking because in terms of spices all you need is a good garam masala which you, these days you can pick it up from pretty much any grocery store um so it's a it's a combination of you know tons of different flavors textures but it's the dressing that brings it all together it's a creamy dressing that has lemon juice cashews um so it's super creamy and then you get a ton of flavor from the garam masala as well as a bit of Dijon mustard for a little bit of kick as well. Excellent. We have vegetable dishes here for chapter four. So dressing up the vegetables a bit here. I love finding new ways to prepare vegetables and this is a great chapter for that. What are a couple of your go-to recipes from the vegetable chapter? I think a couple go-tos, the first being the first recipe in the chapter is flour, batana, and ushak, which is uh, cauliflower and peas. So this is a, what, one dish that I grew up eating quite a bit. Um, my vision is a little bit different because I roast the cauliflower before putting it in because I like that, that the, the charring of the cauliflower. It's it just something magical happens when you do that. Um, so that's one of my favorite go-tos. And then I also like tindora. So tindora is an Indian vegetable. Uh, it almost looks like a mini cucumber. Um, but it's a really unique flavor profile. And if you don't, if you can't find that, you can certainly substitute green beans, uh, which of course are a little bit easier to find. Nice. See, ways to spruce up your vegetables, everybody. This is great. And uh, we've got gravy dishes for the next chapter. And this might be my favorite chapter and the first one I turned to when I got the book. So there's there's just something so good about gravy. And I made the matar tofu first. And I love making the tomato onion masala as the base for this. It was so easy and so flavorful. And you have that great tip in here uh, you know, to make a larger batch of it because it freezes well. So when you, you can have it on hand when you need it, which I just thought was so great. I, that That's great in general, everyone listening. There's items like that where if it's a sauce or something or a stock, you know, you can or, or in this case, a base for something, make some more when you make it, you know, double or triple the recipe and, and freeze a little bit of it so you have it for the next time. I also made the Pollock tofu, and I always love making variations of this because of the vibrant green color, and of course, eating greens always makes you feel healthy, right? So it was terrific and so easy to make. What's your favorite gravy dish? I think like you, I like pretty much every dish in this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, definitely the most popular chapter, I would say. I think when most people think of Indian food, this is the kind of dish that they think of, um, especially here in the U.S., most Indian restaurants have most of this on their menus. So um, I think, you know, I typically say the matar tofu is my favorite, but for today, I, I want to say my favorite is the shahi gobi, and um, I really like that because it has that um, the roasted cauliflower that I mentioned already with something just magical happening when you put cauliflower in an oven. Um, but I combine it with this uh, really rich um, gravy that's something that it might not be as familiar to many people uh, in the fact that it's a little bit sweeter um, and it has a ton of depth of flavor because of the cardamom that's in there and some saffron as well. You know, I agree with you on the roasting cauliflower. There is something magical that happens in the oven with it. That's for sure. And I was feeling that tonight when I made that chili cauliflower and tofu. There's just, you know, the depth of flavor you get from it from just roasting it for a while. It's so nice. That's right. Yeah. Next up, dal, legume stews chapter. And when someone gets this book 
and they flipped this chapter, what's the recipe you would tell them to make first? I, I think an easy answer to that is definitely the third kadal. So um, third kadal is, you know, a, a really, I think one of the more approachable ones because you can use pretty much any lentil that you have on hand, um, such as red lentils, uh, which are probably the, one of the easiest lentils to find. Um, and, you know, that one actually quicks up pretty quickly too. And you don't need a million spices. Um, and, you know, it comes together pretty quickly and easily. Uh, so I think that's a good approachable first one if you're, if you're just new to the Dal chapter. And then getting into a second one from the Dal chapter, what would you suggest as a second attempt? Second one, um, I think I would say the dal makni. So it's a little bit more complex. Not only the flavor profile, it's a little bit more time consuming to prepare, but it just packs a ton of flavor. Um, it's a restaurant classic, you know, dal, which isn't often made at home, but um, hopefully this makes it a little bit more accessible to home cooks. We love accessibility for sure. And we've got uh, rice dishes next and everybody's got some rice in their home usually. So this is great. I've been meaning to make the mint pea rice and my mint went bad before I got to it. So it's still on my list to make, but there's always, you know, so many cookbooks and so little time. But what are a couple rice dishes from this chapter that are always a crowd pleaser? Absolutely. I, I think one of my favorites is the lemon rice. So that's a classic South Indian uh, rice preparation. And I put a little bit of lemon zest in there just to really uh, pump up the lemon flavor in it. So that's a good mm -hmm. go-to, super easy to prepare. Um, and then for, for group gatherings, really the number than rice is a lot of fun because it has nav ratan. So that, that means nine gems. Um, so the gems in this rice come in the form of vegetables, um, nuts, uh, I think dried fruits as well. Um, and so there are nine you know, key components um, it, it, that really just make a, a very delicious rice that um, has tons of colors and flavors as well. I love that. I'm looking at it right now and it's so beautiful. It's got those pomegranate seeds on top too. Right. That's one of the gems. Yes. It, it, that gives it that gem feel for sure. I love anything with the pomegranate seed. That's for sure. Uh, we've got, oh, we dive into the world of Indian flatbreads for the next chapter. And I have to tell you, I made the naan and my husband love, love, loves naan. And he was, you know, at work and he came home and I had dinner ready for him and he thought I picked it up at a restaurant that night. He loved it that much. So it was easy to make. That's compliments to the recipe there that he loved it so much. And, and there is there is there a flatbread in this chapter that you consider to be sort of the easiest one to tackle? Well, that's awesome. I, th I I'm so glad that you enjoyed the naan. I think loved it. <laughs> the naan is probably the most um the most approachable, I would say. I think most people, if they cook already, they've made some side sort of dough that's, uh, you know, had yeast in it. Um, and it, it, it's fairly straightforward as long as you've made some sort of yeasted dough before. Um, so I think that's one of the most approachable. When we talk about the other ones, it, it, you know, it's certainly easy to uh, make, you know, maybe on second or third try. Um, you know, first try might be a little bit more difficult, but I tried to include as much information as I possibly could um, with preparing the other ones, um, just so that you would have everything that you need um, and all the, the resources uh, to prepare those other flatbreads too. Well, is there one that you make more than others in this book? Uh, an everyday uh, flatbread, uh, one that we grew up eating almost every, every time we had Gujarati food was the rotli, which is just a whole wheat flour flatbread. There's really nothing fancy about it. You can make it fancier uh, by added by adding vegetable purees or spices to the to the dough. But rotli is probably one of the the you know one of the go tos in our family. Well, I have a sweet tooth, so I love the desserts chapter, which is next. And if, if you wanted to wow some, let's say, non-vegans with a dessert, what are a couple options from this chapter that you would serve up with the wow factor? Yeah, I think one of the one of the cakes would be a, a good easy one for non-vegans, and actually the the chocolate the chocolate jai mousse. Um, so that's a mousse that 
I, it was made from tofu and chocolate uh, and the combination of both just make for a, an airy um, light dessert. And when you combine it with berries, you get, of course, the, the amazing antioxidants and nutrients from berries as, as well. Um, and I think that's a good, easy one to prepare for um, guests that might not be vegan because you really can't tell anything. At least that's what people have told me when they've tried it is that, you know, they don't miss anything when they, then, when they have that dessert. And you, you know, you've said this, that a lot of the recipes are inspired from growing up. Is there anything from your childhood in this chapter that absolutely had to make it in this book? Uh, absolutely. The, uh, the shiro with grapes and bear, uh, basil, that's one that came from my childhood. So we would always have gatherings um, around August time um, for a celebration uh, called Jan Mashtami. Um, and at that celebration at that festival, uh, we would always prepare, prepare some version of shiro, which is um, kind of like a porridge, I would say, uh, made from ravo, which is a type of um, uh, type of wheat. Uh, so, so similar to like cream of wheat, um, if you're familiar with that, uh, but it's yes. a sweeter version, and I combine it here with grapes um, and holy basil um, just for additional flavor and texture. It looks so yummy. I'm looking at the picture right now. I had I hadn't seen this one before. Oh, it looks delicious with those grapes. I'm gonna have to try this one. Uh, <laughs> yes, let's see here. A lot of freshness to it. Yeah, I, I feel like they would, especially on and the way they're looking here. They're looking so juicy and vibrant. They look delicious. We have the drinks chapter next. I think. Yeah, we got drinks. So a whole chapter dedicated to beverages. And I've got on my list the mint lemongrass chai, but I also have the masala chai. We're big fans of chai in this house. But get me off the chai. What else do you recommend? A favorite beverage or two of yours from this chapter? Yeah, so I again, I call it chai, but it's not your classic Indian chai. I like the iced lemon mint chai. I think that's a lot of fun to have in the summertime. It's um, the, the reason I say chai with it is because it's black tea with spices. Sure. Um, there's no dairy, there's no non-dairy milk in it or anything like that. Um, so it's really refreshing. It's almost like um, an all Arnold Palmer, but an Indianized version of it. Nice. Chutneys and condiments. We move into the next chapter there. You know, the condiments chapter is so great because it sort of gives an overall glimpse of a cookbook, I feel like. More often not than not, the recipes sort of reflect some staples that will be needed in, uh, in the recipes, these condiment recipes, that is. So is there a recipe for, you've got it in here, you've got it for non-dairy yogurt, a date chutney, a, a chili garlic chutney, hello, yum, the garam masala dressing, so many great staples. What is something from this chapter that's always in your refrigerator? I think um, one that I oftentimes have in the refrigerator is the mint cilantro chutney or a cilantro peanut chutney. So, so one of the two green chutneys. Um, that's one that's always you know fresh in the fridge, ready to go because it goes well with so many dishes, um, so many uh, appetizers, um, you know, other dishes within North Indian cuisine. That's one that I oftentimes have in the fridge, and then one that I oftentimes also have is the chundo. So chundo is something that um, you know home cooks might not be as familiar with. It's a, a mango condiment. So it involves a green mango that's shredded um, and then it's essentially preserved. It's almost like a it's almost like a marmalade, but it's made with green mango. And then there's a there's a ton of spices in there too um, that give just a, you know a delicious depth of flavor that goes really well with other Indian foods. I'm here for it. I love that mango, like I said. And we've got the best for last here. Spice of life, you might say. Masala, spice blends chapter. And we've sort of talked about this already. I, I feel like the garden masala is the one that you use the most. Um, is that correct when, when we're looking at spice blends? That's uh, you know, definitely our go-to spice blend. And you know, on the topic, we actually um, just made some uh, a large batch of garam masala to give out to our family and friends um, since we just uh, celebrated my son's um, first birthday. So, uh, oh, hey, happy birthday! Thank you, thank you. So, for all the guests that were there, uh, we gave them a little container of the the freshly made garam masala. Um, and because it's also my son's favorite spice blend too, we added to a lot of his food, and that's been a really great way to expose him to different spices and flavors, also. Oh, I love that! And did you say one year? Just turned one year, yeah. 
Well, so then happy birthday to him and congratulations to you. You made it through the one year. That's fantastic. And so I love that you gave that out as a little gift. Are there, is there another spice in this chapter that you might consider sort of uh, as another item that would be a good gift or something that is also a multi-purpose spice? Yeah, I think a good uh, other gift spice would be the chai masala. Um, so that's just a blend of nice warm spices. And that's something that you can use in place of uh, apple pie spice or pumpkin uh, spice. Um, you know, it's something that you can use instead of those spice blends that work fairly well in things like lattes or cakes uh, or wherever else you would use you know, pumpkin spice or apple pie spice. I can't wait to make up some of these spices in here. It's so nice to, it's it's, it's a very uh, rewarding and accomplished feeling to sort of have your own spice blends that you've made sitting on your shelf that you can use over and over again. So this is great. And uh, we end this book here. You've got, a, I love you have a two page section dedicated to the comments from your recipe testers, highlighting their favorite recipes. To everyone listening, recipe testers, make our cookbooks soar. Without them, we're lost. They are the epitome of honest feedback and they help us get our recipes from good to great. And sometimes they even also help with grammar without apologies. They're fantastic. <laughs> um, you had mentioned the, um, the chocolate chai mousse with the berries and I hadn't seen it actually until I started reading the comments from your recipe testers. And I was like, ooh, I need to make that now too. So it's really great just sort of seeing, you know, these people get as involved in the cookbook as we are. So they really try things several times and they try different variations of it. So it was fun to read that. I really, really love that you gave them some space there. That's, it's well-deserved, of course. It absolutely is very well-deserved. Well, that's Plant-Based India by Dr. Sheel Shukla, everyone. Dr. Shukla, one last question. This is your book brag moment. Please tell me something you're most proud of when it comes to this book. I'm most proud of being so deeply involved with all of the different aspects and decision making when it came to the book. So, you know, every single detail I was closely um, a part of, whether it was, you know, writing all the recipes, doing all the photography, um, being very involved with the editing process. Um, but I think the most, you know, uh, my most proud moment was being able to just have such an important voice um, when it came to all of the decisions that were made for this book. Well, every detail shows through and you have everything to be proud of. It is a stunning, beautiful book full of so, so much for all of our listeners to get right now and get cooking. And now, are you ready for your rapid fire round of questions, Dr. Shukla? I am very ready. All right, here we go. Number one, food on a skewer or a tiny spoon? Food on a skewer. That's a lot more fun. <laughs> and what's a must-have kitchen tool? My hands. Uh, nice. Absolutely. You're the first person to say that. That's great. What is uh, an item on your nightstand right now? Um, my charger was a practical one and uh, a book. There you go. And favorite season? Summer. Absolutely. And have you, um, and you're in Chicago. I love summer in Chicago. Uh, if you go to think back to isolation COVID times, not to take us all back to a dark place, but what was a go-to snack during isolation? Um, so I never really had the opportunity to, to isolate much because I was always going to work, but I will say granola bars. I think that was my- There you go. <laughs> I, same for me. I was always going to work as well, but you know, it didn't stop me from snacking. I'll snack anytime. That's right. uh, favorite classic American dish? Mac and cheese. Nice. Favorite Mediterranean dish? I think hummus would be the easiest answer and, and it's one of my favorites. It's delicious. And favorite vegetable and why? Ooh. Zucchini. I just enjoy it a lot, at least right it's now. It's delicious. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And who's a celebrity you would want to cook for? Mm -hmm. I honestly can't think of any one in particular. I think it'd be a lot of fun to cook for any celebrity, really. There you go. That, that works. Any of them. You'll take any of them. Uh, oh. What's a, a TV game show, past or present, doesn't matter when, that, one that you think you might excel at? Ooh. Um, Maybe Family Feud. Very good, very good. Do you think your whole family would excel at it? I think they'd do great. Okay, all right, good, good, good. Uh, what is your most used emoji? Um, the smile one. 
Uh, very nice. And as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I think I've always wanted to be a physician. Fantastic. That's great. And I got a bonus question for you since you're in the Chicagoland area. What is one of your favorite vegan restaurants? And if you can't name one, you're welcome to name a couple of your go-tos. Ooh. I, one of my more recent favorite ones is Spirit Elephant. Uh, and partly uh, the reason why is because it's in the north suburbs and that's uh, closest to where I live. So there you go. Uh, location is always a great reason. And it must also be delicious, right? <laughs> it's absolutely delicious. Well, that's it. You did it, Dr. Shukla. Thank you so much for being a guest on Keep On Cooking. Please tell everyone where they can find you online and also on social media. Thank you so much again, Dustin, for having me. And for everyone listening, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, my account is Plant Based Artist. Um, that's the easiest place you can find me. Just send me a message if you want to get in touch. Uh, and then you can also see me on my website. Uh, it's shilshukla.com. Uh, and I have some other resources there as well. Excellent. Everyone, you owe it to yourself to go buy a copy of Plant-Based India Nourishing Recipes Rooted in Tradition by Dr. Shil Shukla, available everywhere books are sold. And you also owe it to your senses to follow him at Plant-Based Artists on social media. Thank you again for your time, Dr. Shukla. It was a great pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. I had a great time. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of Keep On Cooking. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a review if you like the podcast. It helps a lot. Yeah. And get more information on the podcast, Dustin's Cookbooks, the Vegan Roadie series, and sign up for our newsletter at veganroadie.com. And of course, follow us at The Vegan Roadie on all social media platforms. Now get in the kitchen and keep on cooking. And hey, remember, it's nice to be nice. <laughs> This has been a Muzzy Cat production. <laughs>